Hello and welcome to House Lights Go episode 4. In this episode I talk to Barry Wallace from the Fratellis. The band recently released their album Half Dead Under a Full Moon after nearly a year's delay due to the Covid pandemic. I'm happy to say Barry joins me now via Squadcast. Hello. Hello. Right. How are you doing? I'm very well mate, how are you? I'm very good thanks, very good. Cool. Sorry about the technical gremlins. That's all right. You're you're in now. I can hear you and see you, which Good isn't man. always the case when people come on. <laughs> I suppose we're we're halfway there. <laughs> so where are you? Is, it, is that your house? That's some pretty cool yes, stuff. Yes, I'm at home you. at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just getting my my gallery organised. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that been a lockdown project? It has been actually. I've stupidly managed to move house twice during this whole lockdown oh, wow. experience. So, uh, yeah, don't ask me why. It's a long story, <laughs> but it's been nice to have the time to. I've got boxes and boxes of stuff, yeah. you know, posters and shit from over the years. So it's been nice to actually get it sorted and yeah, and organised. You know. That's a nice project. Brings back memories. It is memories, a nice no project. Doubt. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the, it's one of the nicer ones rather than painting bathrooms and yeah, yeah, and cleaning out garages, you know. That, that's what I was up to the first few weeks of lockdown: painted the front door, sorted the garage think, out. Yeah, I think everybody did. I think I tidied yeah. my garage. Well, one of one of the garages about six times, and then I moved. <laughs> so, I think it needs but, doing uh, again now, though. But I don't. Probably, probably. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me, mate. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for coming on. Um, you, you, your album's now coming out, I see, or uh, Friday. It's out on Friday, yeah. So it's been uh, aye, it's exciting times. It's been nice because for the past six weeks we've actually had, dare I say it, loads of real real work. Yeah. So we've been doing loads of promo and uh, loads of stream things and all the rest of it. So, uh, yeah, after the past kind of year, two years of doing nothing, it's been nice to actually get in a room with the band and actually do some stuff. So Yeah. What made you settle nice. on, on, on that for it? A date because I saw it was due out last year in May you obviously decided to put it on hold yeah it was it was postponed twice actually oh, so okay. it was supposed to come out it was supposed to come... no no problem it's showing it's showing a good network and it was showing you before it was very bad so that does sound like an improvement I may have to phone yeah, you I... every time I go online then if you can see that <laughs> and I can hey, I was good. just gonna I was just saying, were you um, were you torn between putting it out straight away, anyway, or did you decide pretty quick that you didn't you didn't want to? No, we decided pretty quickly because we had, uh, as I said, I mean, obviously everybody works hard on their albums and stuff, but we yeah. we done a lot of work behind the scenes as well. We made some changes with management and whatever, and we, we were really with loads of with a really good promo campaign lined up. And various yeah. things and whatever, and they were all timed perfectly with the album and the singles coming out and all the rest of it. And it was with it, with probably one of the best years lined up that we'd had since back in the day. So when we knew that we couldn't put the, we couldn't tour and couldn't do the rest of it, we made the decision pretty quickly to, to just try and postpone it as long as we could. Because obviously at that yeah. time nobody knew what the hell was going on. But um, no, I was I was just going through. I was going to be working for. Um, Catfish and the Bottle Men starting last last year. Ah, the family. Oh, you know them, do you? Yeah, Van's uh, one of my second cousins or something. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> um, it's funny. Uh, he, I can't remember. He, he, he used to call me Uncle Baz for a laugh, but um, it's. <laughs> I remember getting Catfish demo well, Van's demos. It would have been years ago from like my yeah. cousin's wife or whatever. It's like, oh, your 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 cousin's in a band. Listen to it. Brilliant. I'd be like, aye, aye, okay. And, <laughs> and then, then when I finally listened to it, I was like, bastard. Uh, I should have yeah. listened, but there you go. Um, yeah, talented young, talented young man. Absolutely. Yeah, they love the guys as well, man. Yeah, I've, I, well, need to say I haven't met them. Was, I think I was meant to start in May for a bit of a festival season, but I was just trying to piece it together. Ah, right. Now and everything that they they they're not that up to date on social media. Right. But I was, I was trying to piece together what my season is meant to look like. And they'd moved everything into May this year from mm. last year. So there was a whole load of festivals and they just moved it on. And now those festivals are now in September. It's just a case of trying to piece it all together, isn't it? And I can see from your 
dates. You had to, you got some in April, yeah, twenty twenty two. Yes, which I guess have been moved on one year. That was the main tour. Um, yeah, I mean you know the, the big tour. Yeah. So the the full UK Buna, and then there was a full American run as well. They get knocked about umpteen times, but again, we yeah. rather we put we postponed those from they should have been April. I can't even remember now. We put, I, we're not no, I keep back. getting confused. I know it's, yeah. it's changed so many times. But we put them back anyway because we postponed them once, and it it wasn't looking like we could do them, and we had to make the yeah. decision to either try and postpone them until later in the year where they might be possible, or just put them back next year. So I think that's. What, what we've done so uh yeah it's april next year will happen now yeah so does that does that mean you sort of found yourself asked about face because you've now got those shows are going to be I, april 22 but you've now got the shows that were always going to be in october oh sorry september october 2021 are, are still there does that does that make sense so you sort of no rather than moving october dates to 2022 <laughs> those are now in 2021 ahead of what the shows in april are does that make sense yes but the new shows that just got announced the other day are literally yeah. new shows. They're brand new. Right. So all the tournaments that's happening next year is the tournament that's supposed to be happening now. Yeah. But um, the ones that we announced the other day uh, is, is a brand new thing. It all happened over the course right. of a couple of days uh, to tie in with the album coming out and obviously the news that, oh, we might actually be able to do something. And then um, we made the decision, well, it was an easy decision to make. We had the opportunity to... Um, to all, all the profits for the tours is going to go to the, the band road crew and oh, wow. uh, local independent record stores that the tickets are available through it's right a, a weird way of doing it but we had this opportunity to do it that way and we thought yeah fuck it why not because we, we just want to play so yeah uh getting the opportunity to just do some shows and about that time was great anyway so they're they're not the album tour, but they're not not the album tour. Yeah, we're, we're just going to and playing some shows because we can, and hopefully, uh, we'll make some dough and give it give it to the road crew who have obviously well, yeah, that's, as affected, that's if not more so than, than us, you know. I'm you just know, gonna. You, someone's actually just come to my front door. This is like classic. Um, it's probably classic, one of your uh, dogs, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, probably is. I'm going to be very quick. Sure, mate. Something I'm waiting for. Sorry, right, I'll on. be one minute. Right there. Go. Must be the most COVID thing ever to interrupt a Zoom call to go and answer the door to pick up some face masks. <laughs> I've done that million times, man. Don't worry. About it. <laughs> um, you were talking about. Oh yeah, you were doing the um the sh the new shows. How how did you manage to get those in though? That must have been quite a an achievement from the uh, booking agents and so on. Yes, I don't actually know because we. Yeah, there's obviously promoter politics because we've got another tour, as we discussed yeah. earlier, like that get moved a million times and you know, that's the main tour, but this one's happening yeah. before and whatnot. But um I guess I mean we made the decision we had to try and play places that weren't on the tour. Um and various things like that. There must have been dates held anyway. Yeah. And because we did it ourselves it was quite a um it was our manager actually that pulled a lot of it off, so he used a lot of his contacts and whatever. And yeah. Because we kind of tied it up as a as a promo thing for the album release. I mean, there's um, there's album and ticket bundles and st stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Makes sense. So I think that's why we were easy. Uh, we were sorry able to put it together so quickly, and we just had yeah. to see right they're available because I mean every band under the sun has got dates penciled in. Yeah, all over the fucking country between now for the next five yeah. years. So I was quite surprised we got it ourselves, but we managed to put this little run together that doesn't affect the cities we're going to in the later tour. And uh, yeah, we were, we were quite happy with that. So yeah, they're they're cool. There's lots of nice venues in there. Yeah, there's some we've be done vibey. years ago, and uh, there's some we haven't been to. And this this is going to be great to play. Although, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine what it's going to feel like or what it's going to look like. Or um, I, I'm imagining they're going to have to have things in place, you know, but we don't know any of that stuff yet, but um, we'll see how it No, goes. but the, the, the intention is presumably, well, I mean, it's after June the 21st, so in theory they should be as close to normal as 
One would hope. It can be. One would yeah. hope. But I, I don't know. But we'll be there anyway. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, it's um. You recorded your album that that finished. You finished recording it before lockdown started. Presumably, there was no complications. Yes. There. Yeah. Yeah. Way before. Have you found that you've, because you've essentially sat on the album, that you've, have you sort of revisited it in any way? Or has it just been parked and, and left? No, you it's, I mean? it's always the case anyway, because when you record something, there's always a, it's never all right, that's it, finished. Key to the record label next week, you stick it out, you know, uh, and then you go on tour. So there's always a sort yeah. of low anyway so generally we find by the time the album we've recorded actually comes out we're already working on the next one okay and you kind of you're fed up with those songs by the time you have to play them you know so that happens generally but obviously that the whole process has been um has been stretched out a bit so i mean i left this one alone for a while because i knew it was coming out and it was a, it was a bit um like, i'll just leave that and we'll listen to it for a while so i, I yeah. had the sort of delight of visiting it every time like a test press and then the vinyl and that was a lovely moment because i hadn't listened to it for months you know and it was like, yeah that's unusual isn't it get the new, and it was <laughs> it was nice you know it was i mean half of it i was like well is that us is that me is something, is that something there so so it yeah, was nice just... to sort of get that side of it you know yeah it's a real change of routine then in, in, in that totally case, I guess. yeah 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 and, um, do you think that that'll have an effect on anything you do in the future? Do you think you might sort of not listen to it, but you you know park up your album, your next album for six weeks before listening to it again? And maybe I mean, as I said, I kind of do that anyway, but um, yeah. just because the process was longer. Um, it's just a nice it's a nice surprise when you when you do give it some space to breathe, especially when you're doing yeah. it and you're listening to loads of mixes and all the rest of it. And um, also, we went back. We didn't tinker with it, but we went back to. Uh, add some extra bits and bobs and b-sides and all that so we had to look at it again anyway with sort of fresh okay. ears and you've got that decision whether to make it as sort of sonically uniformed as the rest of the album or we had these songs do they fit should they be b-sides should they be like deluxe yeah. japanese versions whatever so we had sure. to sort of get into it again anyway but yeah as i said man it was nice to uh, uh it was nice to actually just get that experience of, I kind of felt like yeah. a, maybe a fan would listening to it for the first time. It was yeah, strange. and you, you sort of forget, don't you? It's, it's like a lot of these things. If you if you take a break from it, you you've got a less, you've got a more objective view because you're not thinking about. Say you'd be thinking about your bass parts perhaps the whole time you've been listening yeah. to it, and then you, and you take a break, you can listen to it with some yeah fresh ears. Yeah, the the funny one is the actual recording process. Absolutely, man, and um, I, I do this all the time. It's this is a particularly bass sided comment but uh, the first time i hear it i'm like fucking bass should be louder <laughs> turn that up blah, blah. <laughs> and then you moan about it and then one of the times you get back to it weeks months later you're like oh actually that is quite loud so <laughs> you know you need to trust these people to do what they're do what they're doing yeah i guess that's the whole reason or a lot of the reason that you have a producer to sort of yeah. give you a balanced a balanced ear rather than everyone start trying to fight their corner getting That's... their drums or their bass or their guitar loudest. yeah i mean those those battles are funny man <laughs> uh, they're funny well they're not funny at the time usually but <laughs> they're funny when you think back to them but we've been working with the same producer tony hoffer since well we did our first record and yeah. he's he's done a few since done the last one and the two before that so it's a very comfortable environment working with him and he knows us inside out. We sort of know him. We know how he works. He knows how we work and all that. And he's he's a uh, ah he's very very much part of the sort of process. And also he has these uh, he calls them his his blackmail folder. You know, all these studio arguments <laughs> that he's still not letting me hear. But apparently he's got some belters from the first album. Oh really. And I'm dying to hear them, man, because I remember some of those and they were they were good. But, uh, he keeps promising me he's going to send them, but he never does. Like I said, he, that's his like, insurance. Blackmail folder. Blackmail folder, yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I, actually, do, I, I imagine a lot of producers have got quite a few I, nuggets stashed away for well, the for the uh, memoirs. They must have. Well, that's it. Yeah, you stick them by for your... Uh, for your tail holes later. Not that yeah. anybody want to listen to ever rants, but um, oh, I don't know. I, I think I reckon you can make a good compilation album of just 
and and track so four, the, frate- the fratellis <laughs> want the bass louder, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's not always a bit bass louder, but um, yeah. <laughs> but I would like, I would love to hear those one day. Yeah, yeah, maybe. So you you said that when you finished an album or when an album comes out, you're already on to writing the next one. Um, yeah. Now that you've had this, again, this bigger break, does that mean your next album is much further along than it wouldn't be? Would sorry, would normally be, or are you now? Did you have more of a break completely? If you see what I mean. Both. I know that's a crap answer, but <laughs> it was kind of burst of energy to get it together and start working on it and stuff, and then. They'd be like, oh, I'm not going to be doing anything for the next six yeah. months. I'm locked in a house again till December, so I'll just go and watch TV. So there's been, yeah, it's it's been both, really, honestly. But, um, you know, not to say we haven't started recording it or anything yet, but we've started to sort of formulate plans and there is demos sure. and there is songs and we've, there's, there's ideas and snippets and stuff. And and as usual, it's, it's, it's good, man. It's exciting. Again, it's yeah. something different. It's I'm I'm excited to see where these tracks go. You know, once we once we get into them, which will be how, Christ knows when. So <laughs> yeah, well, how do, how does it work logistically then? I mean, I, I guess you can't sit in a room together and and do it, or you haven't been able to very much. No. Um, so do you make do you make demos for each other and and sort of work around that way? It, it's changed over the years, but John's. You know, John's the main songwriter on the band. You know, he always sure. has been. So, yeah, we get to... Um, sometimes John's demos are as well produced as, like, an album version, and other times it will be a, a guitar idea or whatever, you know? Oh, yeah, it's more of an idea than a yeah, but finished so, article. Sometimes you get his demos and you're like, Christ, what's am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, which is amazing, you know? So... Uh, yeah, it just, it just depends. So we get to hear that, see the ideas at the early stage, or sometimes they come in fully formed, or sometimes they're just, but well, more often than not, they're just absolutely perfect. And you just yeah. try and get it right on the day. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. So that's how it works, roughly. Will, will you be doing this next tours as, as a three piece? I think I saw that you have a session person. Did I see that? Yeah, we've had a, we've had a guy on keys for years now. Yeah. I mean, he's. he's it's been a bit so long, man. He's part of the furniture, so he'll he'll yeah. be there. You know, we couldn't do it without him. Now, um, the stuff we've been doing recently with the promo, there's been um, we've had backing singers and brass guys and all wow. that, and um, it would be great to take them in tour, but I don't think we could afford it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, these are it just comes down to logistics and stuff like that, you know. But um, the the touring party for the band is it's been pretty much the same. Uh, nine ten people for like it's gone on 15 years or something now so yeah we're all set in our ways you know will, will you have um when you have your your, uh, your keyboard guy how, how do you go about changing your recorded material into live stuff does that mostly fall on them or do you do all do a bit is there a bit of track and stuff you, you of course don't have to tell me about that if you don't want to no i'll tell you um it depends again if the song you know straight away whether it's a song you're going to be able to pull off with just the musicians as they are. Sure. Because they have a different vibe. Our songs for the past, however many albums, three albums, say anyway, have been quite track heavy, which was something we used to kind of shy away from. But yeah, you get to the point where you're like, oh, fuck it, who cares? You know, if there's an orchestra playing and... You know, nobody's yeah, going to be it's... waiting to see. You know, it's like it's a funny one, but um, I'm 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 the same. I always used to be, you know, I thought track was was kind of cheating, but the yeah. more it goes on, the more it just seems like the most involved part of a, a lot of the process in turning a, a recorded album into a into totally. a live show that people can afford to go to. You know, yeah, not man. everyone can be Billy Joel and have eighteen twenty musicians on stage and and pull it off. So yeah, I mean, it... that's the way to do it, isn't it? It just depends how it's done. I mean, I've I've been at shows where, you know, there's the main part of a track is like an acoustic part or something, or there's a bit of shredding guitar solo, and nobody's doing it, and you're like, you know, yeah, that's true. I mean, I think I think if you could if you if you're putting it on the track because you can't do it, 
Yes. So there's <laughs> like because you're not capable. So there's like the right there's, thing to do. Yeah. There's things like that, and then there's things that are blatantly obvious that I wouldn't do necessarily. But there's, I think when we first started using it, my my theory was, well, you know, as far as the audience is concerned, uh, somebody could be doing that in the keys or something. As as long as it's not an obvious part that's missing out. Yeah. But that's how it started, and now we've got full-on fucking orchestras and brass section and all that, and, and nobody cares, man. It just makes the show better, you know? And it keeps oh, us in course. time, which is a good thing as well, because we've got a tendency <laughs> to play things at 100 times the speed otherwise. So. Yeah, I was. Um, I chatted with a friend of mine, and he is under the impression that the audiences are, are usually very um, sort of more aware of the the timings of things than, than you'd realise and, mm. and that they're used to listening to ba- live bands now that play to a click rather than, <laughs> rather than yeah. it being all over the place. And actually it's a real skill. I especially think drummers that can play to a click and sort of move around the beat and oh. push the choruses and so on. It must, I, I can't imagine. I mean, imagine having a metronome and then being told to work around it. I can't. <laughs> I know, it's bonkers. <laughs> I, I mean, how to do that. Mince, I will drum up he's, uh, yeah, I've seen him doing it and he will start a song this is something that maybe doesn't have track, but we'll start something with a click. And then we'll, we'll realise at some point that the, the song has to slow down in the middle or something and then get back on the click later. So yeah. I've seen him drumming and taking his earphones out and finishing his bit <laughs> and then back onto the click to finish the song. Yeah, It's incredible. It's an incredible skill. Uh, and I just tap my toes and watch him, you know, I just to try yeah. and do it. So to jump in and out of clicks like that, there's something yeah, else, man. You know, it must be really, it must be really annoying. I'd want to, yeah, I'd be, I even want to tear my ears out and go. Oh. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> I happened. Can't, I can't cope with it. <laughs> it certainly happened, but I mean, back, you know, when we first started out, it was, it was rough and ready and a lot more punky. And as I said, we used to play things easy, six, yeah. seven times faster than album versions and that. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't always it, like it, that. So. You don't always realise, do you, when you play, I mean, this is going way back, when I played in my band, you'd just, you'd record something, and then you'd go and play it live, and then you'd listen back to the live recording, and you'd go, oh, we played that yeah. basically as fast as we could. Yeah, that's <laughs> what we did. I mean, <laughs> we literally done it. Yeah, and I, I used to put it down to yeah. Sometimes it would piss me off, and other times I'd be like, it's just part of the gig experience, and I'm not comparing this in any, in any way, but I used to say, well, people that went to see The Clash... It was an experience being there in that room at that time. And the Clash are one of my favourite bands. I always have been, always yeah. will be. But you listen back to some of the live stuff, and it's not that good. <laughs> but you have to think, what was in the room at the time? Yeah. It would have been incredible. So that, that was my sort of theory at the time. Yeah. I, no, I, yeah. I think that's. I think that's right. I mean, I actually, I think of the live at Shea Stadium. Aye. Uh, that, that actually sounds pretty good, I think. But I know what you mean. There's a lot of other recordings around that are pretty rough and ready, and it does depend on you being there. Yeah, I mean, aye, the Shea Stadium stuff's great, man. But, um, I mean, there's different live clips. I'm, I'm, I'm not knocking the class here because I, I, I love them to death. But sometimes you hear them and you're like, I'd rather just listen to the album version. Maybe it's because I'm not a big live track guy anyway. But um, there's certainly a time and a place for, I think, with a lot of bands and stuff, it's about being in the moment at the time and being in the room yeah. and being part of that audience and part of that band at the time and stuff. A lot of it, she yeah. had to be there, I think. You know? I, I've spoken about this before, but I talked about um, that band at the drive in ah. who were just a, an amazing live band yeah. to watch in a, in a room. But if you, and I think of the Jules Holland performance that they did when they're right. It just sounds terrible. I mean, there's there's no two ways about it. It's just it's just awful. And you, and you think, well, actually, probably when I saw them at the hybrid garage or wherever, they yeah. were equally as awful. But because it was because I was there and because it was an experience, yeah. it's it was mega. You know? It's different things. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to take recorded versions of songs and do live versions successfully, or you get used to doing them successfully when your crowd are gone mental. Yeah, and then you do it in a, like a you know, a, a recorded session environment where there's no audience. You're like, all right, what's what's different here? You know, it's it's much like touring and playing in Japan as well. 
you know, the, the silence between songs and stuff like that. When you when you first yeah, go, it's, I like this. it's amazing though. But when you first go, yeah. you're like, Christ, that's really weird. It's really off. But, but once you get your head in it, it's fine. So I, get, I, I guess it's just, it's hard to, you can either pull it off, but it just shows that the audience is equally as important as the band in some cases. You know, it takes yeah. everybody in that room together to make a gig what it is and to make them different yeah. night after night as well. I've worked with a band that would always try and um, they sort of assess their show afterwards and they try and work out whether it was because the crowd were good or whether they were good. Hi, been worked. there. Can always uh, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah, it's been there many a time, man. Um, but it's weird that if things are going mad and you're on this mad roller coaster and all your gigs are great and all that, you, you do get to a point. It's not, I was going to say it's not arrogance, maybe it is. But you do get to a point of that. Fucking, of course it wasn't. We were fantastic. It must have been them. <laughs> What night is it? It's Tuesday. It's Tuesday in London. No, that was it then. Versus, yeah. you know, it's... it's There's different. definitely an element well, definitely an element of truth in it town by town, especially when it comes to London. Mm. You're sort of more, you're more spoiled. I used to um, always say that. Yeah, because uh, there's so many gigs in London. There's so much, people have got so much opportunity to go and see anybody, so you have to be a bit glad that they came to see you in the first place. Yeah, and if it's a Tuesday night, it can be a different ball game. Yeah, so you were talking about um, it's quite a nice segue actually. The, the crowds being mm. can make the show as much as the band. Yes, is it the crowds and playing live that you miss the most? Do you think? Oh, I just touring, uh, touring yeah. in general. I'm I'm built for. Um, I've got two very happy places in the world. One is in the house when. Kids are all here and everything's happy and we're all healthy and we're having a lovely time. Yeah. My other favourite place in the world has been on a tour bus lounge, you know, driving. Yeah. Driving God knows where with my mates, you know, it's, that's what I miss. I miss the, I'm very romantic about the, the whole thing, you know. I like, I like driving through the desert in America, watching the sun coming up, listening yeah. to tunes and all that. that. That's what I signed up for and I'm, it's never been lost in me that I'm very lucky to get to do that, so. That's sort of the, the side of it that I miss, you know. Yeah. Do you do you mostly all go on the bus together, band and crew? I don't know how. Yeah, I mean, do it sometimes. We were laughing about this the other day. I mean, there, there was a time when we'd, oh, let's get another bus. And then we had to live back years ago, we had two buses in the states for five, six weeks, and yeah, nobody tells you how much this stuff's going to cost you. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. but these days, man, we're only one bus, and it's great. Yeah. You know because. The best thing, as I said, some some of your guys have been with us for the whole shebang, fifteen years. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? These guys are at different stages. I've spent more time with them than I have a family. Family, you know. So yeah, definitely. Some years are like that. Yeah, think. man. Yeah, I know the sound engineer, but then I know my wife. This. So, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I miss about touring. You know, and of course, I miss the, the audiences and the shows. And, yeah, and all the rest of it. But I, I just miss the whole the whole travelling and doing it you know yeah I and how do you feel about service it service stations at three in the morning oh. and stuff like all that I, I love it oh yeah the american the american service stations yeah and the crocodile heads behold. and stuff like that it's just i love it yeah. slices of pizza and weird blue drinks yeah <laughs> massive weird blue drinks yeah massive so how, how do you feel about it when going back do you think are you comfortable with it you know with there being a, a, in a room full of people or are you slightly do you feel wary once we get back to it you mean yeah yeah I think the excitement will override everything else, but I think there will come a point when, uh, you know, there's more than there's more than five people over there. You know, yeah. I think it's going to be very strange. Just being in a, a room or a field or a festival, or whatever, with, with so many people again. I mean, uh, yeah, it's going to be strange, man. There's no two ways about it. But I think the overriding excitement, uh, it's just gonna blast all that to smithereens and gigs and all that whoever it's going to be whoever you go and see or whatever gigs that i'll be lucky enough to get to do or if i go and see a band or whatever they're going to be the best shows in the world for all yeah just after all this shit that everybody's been through man i think there's going to be carnage and i can't wait you know it's going to be so good yeah um 
another Barry, Barry from uh, Mogwai. He just he oh, sort of predicted. He talked about it being a bit like the Roaring Twenties. Yeah. After the sort of depressions, or, the, or the, also after the first the first World War, it would have been. Yeah. And it was started to come out of their shells again. Exactly, man. It's that's a, that's a great way to put it because it's going to be like that. It's it's an interesting one because you could you could think fans will be wary, but I'm I'm with you. I think probably. Once they've bought the ticket, or the ticket is, becomes valid again yes. from last year, and they decide to go, I One. don't think it's a big step from walking into the venue to then feeling yeah. back at home again. Perhaps. Yes, yeah, it's, it's just it's going to be strange, and some people won't might not want to do it. You know, some some people. Uh, yeah. I mean, it might be too strange for people to make that leap straight away. I think I, I definitely think everything in general is going to need time to work its way back to. Yeah, somewhere close to where it used to be. Um, but I, yeah, I think some people might, you know, might not want, might not feel comfortable being in a room with a couple of thousand people, and we, everybody has to sort of prepare for that as well. You know. Yeah, I mean, you'd like to think that people will. Although it's very difficult, isn't it? If you're a big fan of a band, you're going to be really torn if you if you've got yeah. worries about COVID. You, you know, you want to go and see the band. Totally. And then, so I was about to say that you, you'd like to think that people that are wary will stay at home but of course there is always that desire to, to see your favourite band isn't there so it's going to be a struggle for some people yeah no, absolutely and it's going to be um, you know this whole thing has been quite taxing mentally in a lot of people you know yeah. so that you need to think of that aspect of it as well and uh, yeah, it's, yeah it's not going to be plain sailing as much as I'm saying it's going to be great when everybody's back playing and all that I, th- I think it's I don't think it's going to be like Okay, let's let's get into it. You know, it's going to take yeah. a while to to ramp up again. I, uh, yeah. Although I, th- I do think it could happen. I just think it's going to be a case of ticket sales. I, I, I actually have a feeling. Yeah, as you said, once people are in the venue, mm-hmm. you're fine. It's getting them in there in the first place might be a bit yeah difficult, especially when in a venue that's got no, you know, COVID facilities. It's not going to be socially distanced. Yeah, there's fucking no windows. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> possibly even underground. <laughs> an underground place <laughs> with no windows and uh, everybody yeah. squeezed in together. It's just, it's weird though what you get used to. I mean, Christ, man, that, that's been the norm, hasn't it? With sweat yeah. dripping off the ceiling and places and all that. And yeah. Maybe no bit news. It's Probably been a while since you've had sweat dripping off ceiling venues. But... Well, yes, yeah, they do the odd, the odd show, but yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. But you I know, this we can't... can't wait to do some small shows. Actually, oh, they're brilliant. I mean, it's a different. Yeah, again, that's why I'm looking forward to this too. Yeah. In, uh, September, these shows that we're doing because some of them are, <coughs> yeah. excuse me, smaller venues and yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I do feel excited. I, again, this is the whole reason for the podcast and uh, talking about it with you now makes me get that feeling again of feeling excited about about going back. Good. I'm glad I've done something constructive yeah. today then. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's such a big part, isn't it? I mean, of, of my life, that routine of having that big event, regardless of the size of, yeah. of show, in the evening, and that, and that sort of job satisfaction of it going well, oh. or, the, or the fear of jeopardy of yeah. it going badly, just isn't, isn't there delivering groceries, which, you know. Oh. I'm very grateful for having the grocery delivery job. Of I'm course, yeah. I'm extremely grateful to have the... Um, the, the job as a roadie, which is, yeah. I think, one of the best jobs you can have. It is. I mean, yeah. The road crew side of it is, uh, you know, you've, there's no much difference from the, the bands when it comes to the lifestyle and all the rest of it, you know. Except, you know, you guys might have to go up and go in there a bit earlier than the bands. <laughs> things, yeah. things like yeah, that. Yeah, that's uh, the, yeah, it's the, probably the lack of sleep is probably the, well, yeah. um, non, inf- non uh, what would be the word? There's plenty of bands that don't get much sleep, but it's not for the same reason. Yes, I know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, I mean at the end of the day, man, it's a dream job, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, what what do you do yourself? What's your position? A uh, bass tech. Oh, are you? Yeah, that's handy yeah. to know. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's my that's my gig on music. I mean, that's what I, I mean. I was a bass player in my band, so that would be my specialist subject that I can do. Nice. Drums, bass guitars I, I try and stay steer clear of computers and keyboards yeah, like yeah. Them. and i can plug them in and i can press go but that's it's one of, one of my uh, best friends he was my bass tech years ago and we're still really close and he was the same he's he's drums and bass but he, he, he used to be the prodigy's keyboard tech oh wow and he 
fucking hates technology. And I'd be like, well, how, how did you manage it? <laughs> well, I just used to plug it in and make sure the yeah. speakers were pointing at Liam's head. <laughs> but, uh, well, but he used to the, do the same thing. For me, that's the thing, is that if it's... Well, modern keyboards, I understand Wurlitzers and Rhodes and yeah. stuff is a lot more analogue. But you just... To me, it's a case of going to rehearsals, labelling it all up, and then following your colour coding. Yeah. And then hoping nothing catches fire. Um, so I was going to say, what would be your um, sort of main influences seeing a live band in your youth before you were an established artist? Obviously, you were an established artist in your youth also. Yes. Uh, weirdly, it went from, um, I was lucky enough, I shared the room with my brother growing up when he was a mod. So I went to sleep listening to fucking amazing tunes and I woke up listening to amazing tunes from a very young age. So so I was always into the doors and the who and stuff like that way before when I should have been. But the, the first thing that was really mine um, was this sort of American grunge scene. That was that was okay, the yeah. first thing that inspired me that I, I grabbed was mine. And then there's shortly after that Britpop hit and all the rest of it. So that's kind of where I came from. But as I said, my, my brother was uh, in the Northern Soul, Motown and everything anyway, and all the classic mods, ska, two-tone stuff. So I had all that as well and mix all yeah. that with what was mine, the American grunge thing, Britpop, and what's come out the other side. I don't, um, it's all pretty much the same stuff. Bass playing yeah. influence wise, it's just the classics. It's you know John Entwistle, yeah, John Paul Jones, Geezer Butler. I like big fat fuzzy bass. You know, um, yeah, my pedal board's just various levels of distortion. Yeah, and a couple of other things. But um, yeah, influence wise, it's 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 classic, massive bass yeah. players. You know, do you, do you see anyone live that you thought, oh yeah. That they kind of look cool. They're doing what I'd like to do when I go on the stage. Back back in the day, yeah, everybody. Yeah. Everybody, man. I used to go. Yeah. I was lucky enough. You know, I'm from Glasgow, so I went to gigs in the Barrowlands. You know, I was sne yeah. sneaking into the Barrowlands when I was 12. And I don't think there's... I can't think of anybody that I didn't see in a blam. You know, I'm dying to do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I remember early Supergrass gigs back in the day and that he was a massive influence Mickey for Supergrass because the bass lines were so melodic and he was a fan of fuzz yeah. and it was um I've always hated uh you know root note bass playing it gets it gets bad press if, if it suits the song at the time that's fine but it bores the life out of me you know I want, I want to see a bass player going mad I mean I'm not I'm not talking yeah. about Flea or anything but yeah. Somebody like Mickey for Supergrass, whose melodic bass line is just sore in and out through the song. End whistle, John Paul Jones, that sort of stuff. So there's, I love seeing that, you know, and I can't, I can't remember seeing anybody that didn't make me think that's for me one day. Yeah. You know? So that's what, you, that's what you'd be doing. You'd be keeping your eye on the bass player every time. Always I. I probably missed yeah. a lot of good, good moments at gigs <laughs> over the years because I was trying to see what sort of pedals bass players had and stuff. But, um, yeah. Do you know? Do you know a band called the Get Get Up Kids? The Get Up Kids, no. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. I was going to say I, I really like their bass player, but if you haven't heard them, he, but he's got up. a sort of yeah. He's got a. He's actually quite on record, quite a subtle bass player, but yeah. it's really nice, sort of big P bass sounds and very melodic and very musical. Nice. It's pretty cool. I've wrote it there, and I'll check it out now. Uh, so, um, the album I think that's the best is called Something to Write Home About. It's got a robot on the front. On one of the last shows, Muse shows, Weezer supported. Nice. And their cu their current bass player has the most amazing tone I can remember hearing. Mm. Always been great. So, yeah. Yeah. See if you can dig dig out what that is. I can't remember what it is. It's some very very old, tubey amp, and it just sounds yeah amazing. Even in a sort of stadium PA, it's just like oh, that's awesome. They were always uh, noted for their analog and vintage gear, even when they came out. Yeah. Man. Um, yeah, great band. It's yeah. funny, I yeah. kind of forget how much I like them. It's one of those ones that you take something like this to remind you, and you're like, Christ, you know. And, that, yeah. yeah, the Blue Album. I don't, I don't really like anything beyond the Blue Album. I, I like the Blue Album because it's, it's sort of geeky and, yeah. and raw and, and slightly nervous. And I think once they got a bit more confident, I didn't don't like it quite so much. It doesn't quite do the same thing to me. But there's mm. some definitely some cool new songs. I like that Hashpipe song and a few others. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. When I listen to these this afternoon. Yeah. They're, well, the they're, a, they're a Sun Out band. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they did. They done Africa, they did Africa, didn't they? Like, yeah, they did. I think they played quite a lot of covers, and I thought that's a bit weird because they played for 40 minutes, and then they put three. Three really good covers on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is strange. Um, so I was going to finish up, or I'll finish up by saying, what, what's your favourite song to play live? And I'm thinking here, not necessarily your biggest hit, but what you would always want on there for you to do your thing. Ooh. Um, we've got a great track uh, called I Am That. Closing song on the last album, yeah, and it's it's quite psychedelic. It's quite droney. It's something that people wouldn't expect on a Fratelli's records, and we play that live occasionally. And when you play it, yeah. um, it's a definite uh, captures the mood perfectly. It's a definite moment in time, and um. That's one I love playing because it's it's it can't fail to be impressive, you know. And we've we've done it a yeah. few times in various that's, places. That's cool. Yeah, it just it captures everything for me. Um, it's it's got a great high up bass part. It's just got it's, the songs get everything going for it, you know. And it's not a typical Fratelli song, <laughs> but it's a definite. It's as I was saying earlier. It's a you had to be there moment. Uh, and there's been various places where I've got that lost in playing it and that lost in the moment yeah. that I fucked it up. <laughs> One of them was in, a, I think it was in Amsterdam and Paradiso or something, but whoever was doing the lights, it looked like a Velvet Underground gig. The place was oh, wow. gone mad. It was a really poignant moment in the song. And there's a bit in it and I've got a tambourine out and kidding on him, Roger Daltrey, and I'm supposed to come back in at this bass bit and I get so lost and acting like an idiot I've, I've made, made an arse of it you know what I mean so it's a really complex song but when you get lost I get lost in it in a good way um, and it's brilliant I would love to watch that from the crowds point yeah. of view that's obviously something I'm never going to get to do <laughs> I don't think it's ever been filmed or anything but, um, oh okay uh, who, who does the set list is it a band operation um, it used to be but um, we leave it to John now because a lot of it yeah. depends on um his voice, you know. Oh, sure, yeah. So, and the, the set list, we, we might start out with good intentions to do this or that, and then it'll completely drastically change Yeah. through the course of it. So that's something we need to leave to him, you know. Does it, does so. It, so it changes on a nightly basis, potentially, then? You wouldn't go into the studio and do a set list and that's it for the tour, generally speaking? We used to do that, and then we would change it a little bit. But as I said, we've got a kind of core... We've got a core set list if you want, and then things come yeah. in and out, which is good because it keeps it it keeps it fresh and stuff as well. So. Yeah. Um. Yeah. That's the that's the song that I look forward to playing to. Also because it's tricky, it keeps me on my toes. Yeah. And I know it inside out. You know, I I was there and I played on it, but it always gets to that bit, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know what this bit is. Where, it, where does it normally fit in the set list? Do you sort of look at it and know it's coming up and you sort of see it yeah. waiting for that moment? It's yeah. near the end, man, and it's always like... But I know that um, it's a nice feeling knowing that if a gig's been really great, knowing that's coming up. And it's, it's a definite... Again, name, throwing in band names. Now, this is a Doors at the Hollywood Bowl type moment, do you know what I mean? The end, lights out, psychedelic. It's just it's a real... Cool. It's a real belter, so... That's the yeah, one I, I can, enjoy. I can playing. tell by the way you're talking about it how much you enjoy it. I love it, man, and I can't wait yeah. to play again. And we, yeah. yeah. So are there, are there some new ones that you're excited to play live as well? Off the new record. Yeah, there's. A, I mean, we've been doing a lot. As I said, we've been doing a lot of promo and stuff for the past yeah. six weeks, and we've been sort of playing them. Um, there's another couple on the album that I don't think people have heard yet. Uh, Hello, stranger. It's called. That's another album feels of similar vein. It's drony and it's it's washy. Again, it's just not a typical Fratelli song. It's more akin to the stuff that I like. 
it's got a beautiful bass part in it, obviously. Yep. So I, th- I mean, I hope we get to do that one live. It might be one of these ones that just never sees the light of day live, but um, that would be really sweet to play as well. You know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm just I can't wait to play any of them in front of anybody that's not yeah. John and Mince. You know, that would be nice. <laughs> see what people think all right well thank you very much i I always do i've got a couple of questions to ask you after i've stopped recording if that's okay and i'm going to tell you a little story as well which you might you may or may not remember you you were there so i was there yes yeah unfortunately that one's not going to be suitable for broadcast on the next episode of house likes go is charlie rickard from independent venue week thanks again for listening see you next time